Hello and welcome to this episode, which is based on the presentation from the 6th Congress of European Otorhinolaryngologists held in Milan from the 29th of October to the 2nd of November. It was a roundtable discussion on deep learning applied to laryngeal evaluation with Crystal Kalling from Estonia as chair and Alberto Padano as moderator. The result was informative, and we are therefore sharing this on YouTube as well. The presentation was focused on the technical risk and bias associated with high-speed video and stroboscopy for quantitative purposes. These are the related articles and books. In a collaboration on high-speed video and deep learning for the segmentation of glottis, we noticed an issue with some of the videos. Several videos, although adequate to make a laryngological evaluation, was unusable for quantification with deep learning. This sparked a study on the accuracy of these recordings, in which we sought to find the prevalence of individual risk and biases. It was necessary to identify which areas of the larynx should be fully visible at the recordings. The list was vocal folds, arytenoid region, epiglottis, and the false vocal folds, with room for others to be added. The images shown are example of a recording with the identified areas fully visible. Some of the areas are outlined for representation purposes. This was the most common issues found in the study. They are each visually represented. And on the following slides, we will go through each issue on this list. The first issue on the list is lacking vision of the rear part of the vocal folds. This can be due to swelling of the arytenoid region or the camera being held at an angle. We have made a uh, guesstimate of the vocal folds obstructed by the arytenoid region to illustrate the point. The next issue is with the epiglottis or the uvula blocking vision. We have outlined the uvula on the image, which is causing more obstruction of the vision than individual parts. In some cases, parts of the vocal folds were not visible due to more than one factor. Although some recordings allowed for a full view of the important areas, the phonation may not be visible or the patient unable to create a visible vibration of the vocal folds during the examination. Some videos were unusable due to the entire larynx being constricted, often as a result of reflexes. The outline is an attempt to illustrate the curve of the epiglottis. Some recordings were lacking full vision of the important areas due to the camera being positioned at an angle. At times, almost all areas were visible, but just lacking vision of the front part of the vocal folds. A segmentation can be performed, but would be inaccurate due to the front part missing. Although the vocal folds are visible and a segmentation is possible, the arytenoid area might have importance and an attempt at making sure it is visible at the recording should be made. Before conducting the study, we sought guidance with our statistician to determine how large a sample size was needed to document the findings. He calculated the 95% confidence intervals with various sample sizes and he concluded that a sample size of 100 would be sufficient for our study. The results of his calculations are shown here. To randomize the selection process, a randomization algorithm from a computational platform was used. 
These are the results from the study. The occurrence of each issue is listed, with only 51 out of 100 having the identified areas fully visible. Besides the 51% that were usable, the three largest categories found in the study were recordings from an oblique angle and with a lacking vision of the front part of the vocal folds and the arytenoid region. The examination was performed on a sustained vowel with equipment from Richard Wolf that records at 256 times 256 pixels at 4000 frames per second. Newer equipment is available with higher frame rates and more pixels. Other issues with recordings not included in the study, but important topics for the roundtable discussion at the Congress, was the use of different head registers. Upper and lower register is visually different from one another, and the lower should be used as standard. It is important to use a sustained phonation. If stroboscopy is used, any abnormalities must be observed consistently and only high-speed video can be used if the abnormalities are transient. The frequency and decibel are most often recorded automatically, but it is important to ensure that the equipment is including it. The causes for the videos not being usable identified in the study were mostly related to how the examination was performed and not to the equipment nor to the patients most of the time. So even though the recording were high-speed videos, this makes it possible to extrapolate the results to other recording methods like stroboscopy, NPI, white light laryngoscopy and video endoscopy. If we had known this at the time of recording, a simple adjustment could have solved this. Often, this would require only a small extra effort to achieve, making this information important to share. Our recordings were conducted on high-speed video because the real-time movement of the vocal folds are preferable for function evaluation in comparison to the slower frame rate of stroboscopy. But both video endoscopy and stroboscopy are sufficient for classifying disorders. We made this presentation because good diagnostics and research are dependent on a proper data material. If we are to make high quality evidence-based studies, we need high quality data and insufficient videos are a bias in research. We need machine learning and deep learning, as it is useful for large cohort studies and organizing unstructured data. We have suggested combining high-speed video with ultra-high resolution optical coherence tomography for tissue evaluation. Thank you for your time. We hope that this information will help improve science and diagnostics.